from the studios in Joplin, Missouri, Good News Productions International presents Venture in Faith. Outstanding Christians of our generation telling their own story of how God has worked in their lives. Your host, Boyce Moton. This venture in faith is about Lois Reese. I just met her a little while ago, and even in the short time that I have met her, I have come to appreciate her as a person of deep conviction. The scriptures in the first chapter of the book of James offer some tremendous promises to those who have convictions. A double-minded person, the Bible teaches, is unstable in all of their ways. Lois Reese is not a double-minded person. Lois, you told me that the first time you ever thought about being a missionary, you were 10 years old. Tell us about it. Yeah, that's right. Well, I was out herding sheep, and of course, we had studied the Bible so many times, and Daddy had read about Paul and Timothy and the others going out, and I had met one missionary, and that was at a little house place where we were working, and I was just throwing a lemon up in the air. Now, the reason I was throwing a lemon up, because that year we didn't have enough money to buy balls or anything for Christmas. Mother put them in there to see they were old dried lemons that she'd put away and forgotten. And I was tossing it up and catching it. And I was thinking and just to myself that I wish one day I could be a missionary. I want to be a missionary. And then I scolded myself and said, oh, you stupid thing, you know you never can, and so on and so. The thought passed me, but I thought how wonderful it would be to have that kind of a life. But I was out herding sheep, and I had to watch for coyotes and things like that, and rattlesnakes. I've killed many rattlesnakes while herding sheep, but I was only 10 at that time. And that was, I think I was 9 when I killed my first rattlesnake. And that was in the state of Montana? Yes. And the weather in the wintertime is extremely severe? Yes, very, very much below zero. What's the coldest you ever saw it? 42 below zero, and I was herding sheep. And I was so cold, I had to run all day long up a mountain, not a mountain, but a hillside and down a hillside, try to keep from freezing, even though I had on the warmest clothes. And it was just colder than humans can bear. At the present time, you are working in India, which is one of the most populous countries in the world. And yes. I think the most densely populated country, or among the most densely populated countries in the world. That's a dramatic change from Montana. Sure is. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones in India are now my sheep. <laughs> and uh, it gets to, what's the hottest you've seen it in India? Well, I don't really know, but I have been in a place where the temperature goes way up to 118, 120. Now, when we first started working on our ground, uh, I have, in one of my newsletters, I have that I slept last night, and the temperature today is 118. And I was sleeping outside, just on the ground, because inside we had a little hut place there. But it'd be too hot in there, so I slept out on the ground, and the people going by used to holler to me in the middle of the night on moonlight nights and ask me how I was and what I was doing and stuff. But I was not afraid. And you have months in India with no moisture? Is that yes, correct? that's true. We I, do. It's I very dry. I got to be days. there last January, and they said it might be August before it rains. Just yeah, well, Emma said it did rain last year. If I got some rain. Uh, you went to the mission field as a team 42 years ago. You and your husband David. Tell yes. me how you met David. Well, I went to chapel, and uh, that was in Indianapolis, Indiana. My father would always be in the chapel. And uh, I w he was working, and I would always go to the chapel and sit with him. And David was a singer in the quartet. And then finally I met one of the uh, people from the choir, and he had asked me to go to a certain place to a meeting. And that was the first time that I ever met him. But we just simply spoke then, and later he uh, started coming to sit with us if we went to a convention or somewhere and he was there. He would come and sit with my father and I. 
But your conviction to be a missionary had deepened to the place now that you were already committed to the mission field. I was before already you met committed David. to go out with Isabel Didamore, and that was, I had met her while I was still in Bible college, and she had not said yes yet then. There was two of us wanted to go, and she said, well, I only would want one. And so then when I graduated, I came down and I said, Isabel, would you by any chance, would I be the one? And she was real happy and grabbed me and squeezed me and said, yes, I, you are the one I wanted. So her brother, Mark Maxey, knew me very well. And you had no way of knowing that David had dreamed of being a missionary? Well, no, not yet at that time. I had no way. I didn't know David at that time. Now, tell us a little bit about David and... Uh, your first date, because I think that this is going to <laughs> confirm to our viewers the fact that you are a person with some real convictions. Well, I was determined to go and be a missionary regardless of what, because I had for so long wanted to, and here was my chance. So I was preparing, and uh, when I had been asked by David, I actually I had somebody from India in my house as a missionary. She was a speaker there. And she was also single. So that day, David called up and asked me if he could come out, take me out for a date. He and this boy were going. And I said, well, no, because I have a missionary here and I can't go off and leave her. Oh, good, just a minute. And so here he was back. Yes, we'll both come. We'll have a double date. So, okay, I agreed. The other man had a car. So we went out to one of those, I think it was, it was a, a quick food, I think it was uh, pizza, pizza Hut. Probably the first Pizza Hut there ever was, I don't know. <laughs> but we went out there and we had our pizza and sat in the car and ate it and everything. And then while we were, they were talking in the front seat, she was telling about India and so forth. And then uh, my husband said to me, I mean future husband, I was telling him that I was going to be a missionary, and he said he had intended to be a missionary, and the girl that he was going with had jilted him. And then he said, uh, just before it was time for us to leave, he said, uh, well, now, should uh, you go to India with me and be a missionary, or should I go with you to China? And I just wasn't convinced. I said, well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to China. So to China we went. <laughs> But this was on your first date. First date, he proposed. Of course, I'd met him a number of times and so on. And your courtship lasted about a year. Yeah, off and on, because I was traveling and speaking. And uh, he wrote occasionally, but it's, when you're traveling and speaking, you don't know where you're going to be either. And you had the honor of being married by Warren Didamore. Yes, Warren Didamore performed the ceremony. When Isabel had decided to take us, she herself was not yet married when she decided to take me. Then later she married Warren. And uh, you and your husband were in California in language studies? Yes, we were in Chinese language study. And uh, well, one thing that I'd like for people to know and understand is this, that when you've decided to be a missionary, even though you know other missionaries are being killed, it's not going to affect you. We were in a Chinese language school, and there were many missionaries from many uh, places, mostly Baptist and uh, Church of Christ people, and some Methodists and so on. But every one of us were planning to go out, and Betty, Betty Stam, I believe it was, and her husband were killed in near um, one of the big cities from the communists. But yet, though every one of us was planning to go to China, not a one of us thought of turning back. Nobody, it, I didn't even think of it at the time, but later I was thinking it over, and not even one person said, oh my goodness, if they're killing Christians there, then I'm not going. We all said, we've got to study harder, we've got to go and get China before the communists do. And we, after we went over there then, we started a little church while we were just waiting to get our supplies up country, and we found a, some people that would come and listen, and we started preaching and teaching, and there was a young preacher that was willing. He wasn't too young. He had a young daughter. But uh, he came and started preaching for us, and we were having baptisms. We had to buy a little tub <laughs> to baptize people in. Not so little either. It was long enough to baptize people. And then finally we found a river after the river was up high enough, but that was too hard to get into, and the water was dirty, so that's why we kept on with the tub. And so we were baptizing there. 
And later, that is the same place, same house, I believe, that Daddy Morse was captured in. And he came down and was taking care of that church after we had gone up country. And he stayed on there. You're in language school in California. Yes. And you received word the, that Warren Dittimore had died. Yes, we received, first we heard that Betty, uh, Betty Stam. And then it was later that we heard that Warren Dittimore was dead. We got a cable saying, where are the Reese's? Warren Dittimore is dead. Where are the Reese's? We were still in California packing to go, and we just immediately What was your hurried. husband's reaction? They were very close, weren't they? Yes, very close. Warren. So was I, but my husband broke down and cried and cried, and he said, why didn't God take me instead of Warren? He said, he's such a perfect man. He felt that Warren could have been more use than himself. What year was this you were going out, Lois? That was in, it was in 1946 that uh, this happened, and in 1947 we were already in China. It was a very volatile time politically, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, we knew that the communists were coming, but we just uh, wanted to work until we had to get out. I mean, how can you explain it? When that's your life, when you're dedicated to it, and you know that other people have been killed and so on, then even though you know that you may be killed, it's not going to stop you from telling others. I understand that in 1949 there were something less than one million believers in all of China, and perhaps half of them died during the Cultural Revolution. Yes, it was very terrible. Some people that I knew were killed, and we received word that they were killed. One of our teachers was killed, one of the ones that was teaching us in the Chinese language study when we were there in China. Not was everyone, also killed. Not everyone knows whom, the man whom you called Daddy Morris. That's J. Russell Morris. J. Morse, Russell Morris, yes. He went to China in 1921 and yes. spent 15 months in solitary confinement. And uh, you were five years in China and Burma. Yes. But they wouldn't let you go back. No, uh, they wouldn't allow us to go back because communism had already progressed and they had all the Morse family. See, we were in China and we had to flee from China over the hump into Burma. And then while we were in Burma, we had peace and we could teach and, and be there. But then when it was time to go, I knew, I just knew, the Lord had let me know somehow that we would never be back. And I wept and wept. And my husband said, well, don't cry, Louie, we'll be back, don't worry. But I knew it wasn't going to happen. And sure enough, the communists came and everybody had to flee. The Lord closes doors, but the Lord also opens doors. Yes, that's right. When the Holy Spirit forbade Paul to go into Asia and Bithynia, yes. he opened the door to Troas. Yes. And ultimately into Macedonia. So in your life, the closed door in China and Burma meant an open door in India. Yes. In Meghalaya, that's uh, way up in the northeast of India, and that was a very open field. We have started many, many, many little house churches. We have seen many buildings built. Now don't think of an American church. <laughs> you just think of a little hut that's thrown together in a hurry with straw, woven straw sides and uh, grass over the top or a special kind of straw. And then for benches you have two bamboo poles like this and then a bamboo stretched or a little tiny uh, board or something across that and then you just sit there and if you're lucky your feet reach the ground but most of the time we would sit right on the floor in the houses when we first started. I think our viewers might be interested to know about the marriage customs in the Kasi Hills. Well, all right, the marriage customs there, you see you have to think of the uh, Lisu people, of the uh, Kasi people as having been a migratory bunch. They were chased from way, way, way up north somewhere. They're light. They're not as dark as the other Indians by any means. And they were a tribal people. And the men were always going ahead and they were hunters and this and that. And sometimes they would go someplace and marry and not come back. And his wife and children are here. And so the, it's a matriarchal place. And they have something like that also in Corella, where you were, whether you know it or not. They used to be matriarchal, and some places they're matriarchal too, to a certain extent, but in a different way. But uh, the Kasi, very definitely, the woman owns the property. She 
the man can ask her, but she says yes or no, but usually she will ask the man. And uh, when she says... If she wants to get married, she sees a fellow she likes, she walks up and proposes. Well, it, that, if her first husband has died or gone, yes. But the parents make the first wedding as a rule. The parents will make the first wedding, and it'll be a big and grand and glorious affair. And the man comes and fits himself into this family and into this family's property. But he doesn't own anything except the clothes that he came in with. And if he had a suitcase, he owns a suitcase. And when he goes out, if she sends him off, he takes that with him, and that's the end. And she keeps the property. She keeps the property. She keeps the children. And she gives the and children. And the children have her name, her tribal name. Now... You worked there 15 years. Yes. And uh, it was, how would you characterize those 15 years? It was heavenly. We, I tell you, I walked, I suppose, if you tried to measure it all, probably a thousand miles in those five years. But it was mountains, cliffs. Sometimes I've walked around cliffs, and you don't know if you're going to fall off, if you're going to stay on. But it was the same way in Lisu country. Lisu country was much worse for that. I have held my breath and hid my head and waited till I got more courage to get around some of their corners and then crawl around and go. But uh, in, in uh, Kasi Hills, we had same rocky places, but not with high, high mountains. But always it would be walking part of the way. Very few churches had a bus right to the, close to the place. So I have walked miles and miles and miles. I've walked 15 miles in one day. And you have three children. You and yes. Dad had three children. Where were the children born, Lois? Well, Emrys was born in the United States, and Warren was born in China. Then Lois Kathleen was born when we returned from our first, on our first furlough. But the children were all raised on a mission field. They right? were all raised on a mission field. And they, Emrys and... Uh, and Warren had graduated from Woodstock School. And then was the, perhaps one of my most trying times. Okay, I was the mother, and I went here and there, and I taught and I spoke, and quite often my children went with me. But when they had to go away to school, and I knew they would not be under myself or Mrs. Fairbrother, who is such a wonderful Christian teacher, then I didn't go to tell him goodbye, and my oldest son looked at me with a sly grin and raised his eyebrow and says, I know why you don't want to go, Mommy. You don't want to cry. So I cried right there. <laughs> the thought of them leaving the home and having to be taught by others, and I knew I couldn't see them until nine months was finished, you can't imagine the horror of it. Many, many hardships, but still you never wavered. You no, stayed right in there no. on the mission field. This was the life that God had given you. Yes. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven of the wind and tossed. And that kind of a person does not receive a blessing from God. That's now, true. after 15 years in the Kasi Hills, you moved to southern India. Yes. The state of Tamil Nadu. Right. Tell us about that. Well, India said that the Kasi Hills was a troubled area and that no one could be up there. But they left my husband and I up there because he was a Britisher for some time. But then the time came when we were asked to come down and work in another place for a while, which we did. And they had, in the meantime, they had gotten more tight and they'd closed it up and we had taken everything we had down. Uh, not everything we had, but I mean, whatever we could carry. Most of our stuff was left up there and we never got it again. But anyhow, uh, we started work and then we, the people from Andhra Pradesh kept coming and begging us. There was one man, most of the people in Andhra Pradesh are short, but this man was a king's son or from uh, high caste, and he was a wealthy man, and he kept asking and asking and begging for us to come up and do leprosy work there. And we didn't want to do leprosy work, we wanted to do church work. But then one day I was saying to my, telling my husband about it, and this man had been sitting there for hours, and finally we got a translator. And then I said, well, but we don't want to do leprosy work. He said, why not? So I thought, well, if David wants to do leprosy work, okay, we'll do it, because we knew we could do church. We'd already been starting small churches, going to places to preach up in Andhra Pradesh. 
and we were also formerly working in there in some places. That's when they saw how we worked, and that's when why they asked us. So then this man had a cousin who was in the Senate, or some he would be like a, the head of the Senate, the man that was there. And they called uh, him, this big tall man that was a petty official, called his cousin, and his cousin came and visited us and begged us, said, we'll give you land, we'll give you everything, you come up, we need workers. And then I found out that even some of their relatives were leprosy patients, that's why they were so anxious to have us come, of course. And uh, so that's how we got the land. They gave us the land and everything, and we decided we would work. And it was in that work, we were doing leprosy work up there and some church work in outlying villages, but still we were teaching in the Bible College in Madras, which we still are. And it was going down for a big church meeting in the a church where Leonard Thompson preaches, uh, preached at that time, and Emerson and was also going down. Emerson had, all, uh, had already gone down with a carload, and David was going down with one boy, American boy. And that was when David was killed. They were going down to preach in Madras in the evening meeting. Our classes, of course, were daytime classes. Our viewers may not be aware of the fact that Lois' husband David did die some 12 years ago on the mission field. Yes. But once again, you didn't look back. You just kept your hand to the plow and kept on plowing. There wasn't. Well, in the first place, uh, again, the Lord gave me a notification that something had happened. I just couldn't rest. I couldn't feel quiet. And I went out and took a long walk, and still I wasn't happy. I wasn't quiet. I couldn't go to sleep. And I was walking, just walking in the yard, and I found some people that were teaching or preaching in the yard. And so uh, it was some bunch of Lutheran men, and they asked me to come and sit and listen. So I did. And then uh, after that was over, I felt a little more quiet, and I went in, but I knew something was wrong, and I was asking, did I not tell David goodbye? Had I done something to hurt him? Why do I have this feeling? And I just couldn't quite feel it, but I thought, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I asked the Lord to, if whatever it was I had done or something to forgive me, if there was any sin on my part, and then I went to sleep. And then in the middle of the night, there was a knock on the door, and it was Emrys, and Leonard Thompson, and when Emrys opened the door, he, I opened the door and I said, oh, son, what's the matter? And he didn't say anything for a minute. He came in and put his arm around me, and then he said, mother, dad was killed in a car accident. So, of course, from there on, you can imagine what happened. I had to pack up in the middle of the night and go back with them. And where are you going to find things? What do you need? It was trauma. But, of course, there was never any thought in my mind of turning back, never. I knew the work was going good, the work had to go on, and as soon as the funeral was over, we just simply started right in again. Emerson took a much heavier part after that. He worked with us, with me, I should say, very closely after that, and now he is the At a time uh, when a lot of widows would have been concerned about their own financial future. I understand one of the first things you did was to give away a house after your husband's death. Yes, my husband had wanted to give that house. The house was our property. We had bought it, paid for it. We had the papers, everything. But there was a young minister who wanted to work down there, and my husband wanted him to take that house. He wanted him to have a house. So Emerson and I didn't want the house because we didn't intend to live in Madras. And so we gave him and we convinced him then. And by that time he was married and had a family, so he took over the it's house. A, it's a very lovely home and worth a lot of money in India. And I yes, understand that's true. that uh, it had been purchased with insurance money and, and inheritance that your husband had received from yes. his father. Yes. Well, when, when you think of it, now mission work isn't mine, it isn't yours. It's Christ, isn't it? All right, now if I use that money and I keep or I sell that house, then I'm keeping everything. And here's a man who is more capable than I. He's a PhD 
He has need of a house, a place to stay, a place to preach. He has nothing in this world. And then if I can give him something, a place to start his family, it's more valuable to me than money. Tell me about working with lepers. Oh, I, I have to apologize. I'm in, Lois has corrected me already. Once you label somebody, they are to a certain extent dehumanized. So you never refer to a leprosy patient as a leper because they're, yes. it, they're categorized or pigeonholed. They are a human being yes. afflicted with a disease. You wouldn't say there goes a TB or there goes a pneumonia, would you? No. There goes a TB patient, there goes a pneumonia patient. All right, then there goes a leprosy patient. Then I thought I wouldn't do that, Lois, but I, <laughs> I'll have to work on it. All right. Well, I'll tell you. When you know that these people are so human, and you know how they are pained because they are kicked out of their homes often, they're sent out to beg, they're not given anything. So if I can comfort them in any way, I have slept on their floors in just little broken down shacks and things like that. I have stood by them in death and held their hands. I have worked with them as my brother or my sister. And if they are Christians, they are. If they are not Christians, I want them to be Christians more than anyone because they suffer humiliation that you cannot imagine. So if they have Christ and can have heaven, how wonderful. The area was very primitive when you first went there. And it still, still is. Still is primitive. <laughs> but it was very primitive. Uh, the land that we had, I mentioned sleeping on the road, uh, beside the road. We had a little tiny hut there, but the hut was so hot I couldn't sleep in it. And uh, we had some people working there. We had one man working there. We came out there to bring out some supplies. And the fellow wasn't there. We wasn't anywhere. So uh, Banasan, do you know Banasan Yuria? No. Well, he's a young missionary also, and his wife was a South Indian, and she was an Anglo Indian. She had been uh, very, very high caste. Her father, her uncle, or father, or some, her father, had been an uh, Englishman, and she was half and half. So she had come up to be with me. I was going to go up on that truckload with those men alone, and she said, Lois, you can't go with that bunch of men. I said, somebody's got to. And my husband had just told me to go over the phone, and she says, well, I'm not going to let you go alone. So, okay, she got on there, and we went up there, and when we got there, there was nothing but a little broken down shed that the Chucky door, that means the night watchman, was supposed to be, and I was afraid he wouldn't be there. That's why I went with this truck, you see. They were taking a load of supplies up to, for the, to build a house. So when we got there, the trucker said, well, where is your man? And we said, well, we're sorry, we can't find him. And he said, they just took their things out, threw it on the floor, laid down, went to sleep. So I said to her, well, now there's a little shack off over here somewhere. We can go there and sleep. Well, there were rats and snakes up above overhead. I got some sleep, but she didn't sleep a wink. And she said, that's the night I decided to marry Babanasan the next day, because if God could take care of me through that night, he could take care of me through anything. Now, for me, it was nothing. I had already been sleeping out there for many, 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 many nights. I knew the villagers were friendly. They were innocent people, though they weren't Christians. And so I wasn't worried a bit. When I was there just a few weeks ago, Lois, I thought about Jesus because it seems like the villages are very little different from what the villages would have been in Palestine 20 centuries ago. That's right. They have very little. And the common people work for less than a dollar a day, I'm told, in American currency. Yeah, that's right. One of the things that impressed me the most were the duck farmers. I just <laughs> had uh, the idea of somebody spending his life herding a few ducks. Just well, that's just like herding sheep. When you get done, you ship them off, you get the money, the money is yours, and so on. But the duck herders are just like a hired shepherd. They're not always the owners. The, uh, there's a poem, and uh, it talks about men. Forgive me, but I want to say this poem because I think okay, it applies go ahead. to you. The tree that never had to fight for sun and air and space and light that grew out in the open plain and always got its share of rain. It never became a forest king, but it lived and died a grubby thing. 
And the man who never had to toil with hand or mind mid life's turmoil, who never had to win a place for sun and air and sky and space, he never became a manly man, but he lived and died as he began. Good timber does not grow in ease. The rougher the storm, the tougher the trees. The further the sky, the greater the length. And the rougher the storm, the greater the strength. So through rain and cold, through sleet and snows, in trees as in men, good timber grows. And Lois, I've just been reflecting on your life, the hardship you had as a small girl, yes. living in a little shack up in the mountains of Montana, herding sheep at 42 degrees below zero, actually going bankrupt and having to leave that part of the country, the hardship you must have gone through in your college education, going to a mission field that turned communist and having to leave there, breaking your heart, pioneering in another work in the Khasi Hills in North India, going down into southern India and working with the lepers. It's been difficult and hard, but it's made you strong and tall. <laughs> and it's helped you to have a faith which is indeed radiant. Thank you. What is the biggest challenge that you have faced in the 42 years you've been on the mission field? Oh, my. Well, I think the biggest... Well, the biggest heartache was having to leave Lisu country. The second biggest was having to leave the Kasi Hills. But I don't, can't really say what the greatest challenge was. Perhaps it was uh, when uh, the officials came and said that we had to leave, and we uh, pled with them, and my husband went to the government, and I was waiting and waiting in uh, Calcutta, and they said we could go back. And then when we went back to do everything there as fast as we could, perhaps that was the biggest challenge. Or perhaps it was the biggest challenge when, we, when I had to go on alone without David, but I already knew, even as soon as I heard that, I didn't, I didn't even think. Somebody asked me, are you going to keep on, Lois? And I said, why, of course, because to me there, there wasn't any other way. I mean, that's just the way it is. When you're doing work, you just keep on doing it. And I never asked Emrys to come and take over, but he did uh, come. He gave up his own plans and came to help. And that was, of course, one of the biggest thrills that I ever had. And um, of course, there are challenges, some of them that you don't even like to talk about because they end in sorrow and so on. But one of the greatest sorrows I ever had was when we were accused of having do, done wrong things and having cheated and like that. And we lost a lot of money in the deal, but we just went on. The money was gone. We sold our land uh, to help someone else out, and they never repaid it or anything. But yet, uh, I think we were stronger because of it. One of the things that depressed me about it, not only the millions of people, but it was the fact that there were 400 language groups in India and 33 major languages. Yes. So you started out with Chinese and then you went to the Lisu and then the Kasi Hills and then in the state of Tamil Nadu, it's the Tamil language. And then in Andhra Pradesh, it's a different language. Yeah, in Andhra Pradesh, it's the Telugu. The Telugu. Mm -hmm. or, different uh, race of people. And uh, it's just overwhelming to see all of these people who are enslaved. The people are really not happy worshiping demon spirits, are they? No, how can they be? But yet, they have been at this so long, they have to have something they can see. Now, if, they'd, if I would let them worship me, they'd do it. I've had them try. I'd jump and run. But you see, they go to the feet of this goddess and they plead with her, and I'll, if you'll give me, I'll do this. And men who are violent men will say, if you will just kill this man somehow for me, then I'll give you this and I'll give you this and I'll give you this. And many times the demons are able to cause the death of people and things like that. We've seen it. I know people in America don't realize the power of demon possession, but I have seen it. We've all seen it. And 
we have won people to Christ away from demon possession and oh, the joys they have in the freedom after they get through with it. They just didn't have any idea. But uh, sometimes it's very difficult. One of the greatest problems we have is that the people will want to come and get a job and sure, I'll be a Christian because they've seen it in other places. If they become a Christian, they get a job. Well, that isn't the reason for Christianity and we have to teach and teach and reteach. And when we take Hindus, sometimes they are uh, upset with us, but we have to take the person who's the best qualified, and then we have to train that person, and we hope and we pray that they'll be Christians. And some of our workers have become Christians, not only themselves, but they have won their father and their mother and their brothers and their sisters and their whole families and like that. So uh, we realize that through leprosy work, we are able to reach them. You have... Uh had members of your family, we were just talking a little while ago about Dan, yes. who, who lost a leg. Yes. The, your uh, co-laborers, the getters, lost a son to yes. death in India. Yes, that's right. Uh, there are constant dangers. I was told that uh, the cobra is sacred. Yes. And uh, the cobras are really not killed, so there are a lot of them. Yeah, but I kill them. <laughs> I have a cobra skin. And the cobra was exactly the same height I was. And it was in an area where little tiny children like this and up to this high would be herding sheep and goats and uh, cattle. And it was a thorny, bushy place. And I knew that those children could be struck and killed or their animals could be. So I started throwing stones at that. And it got in the cactus tree and was all ready to spring out at me. So I ran around behind and broke its back over the... Um, tree and then of course it fell out of the tree and I finished killing it and I have its skin with me. <laughs> well when we were there we were told this a few days before in one of the areas where we were that a, um, a cow had died yeah. uh, from, a, from a cobra bite. It's not uncommon. Uh, there are many many dangers. There are some of the Christian people have been killed for their faith or at least beaten. We, oh yes, we, oh yes. And yet you keep going. Well, you talk about people being killed for their faith. Well, all right, that's as a glory. But how many of you people get in a car when you know good and well somebody was, the whole family was killed yesterday? Doesn't that take faith? I don't see the difference myself. If I go out to a place where I know somebody's going to kill me and I'm working for Christ, well, I have a better chance than somebody that's going out there that doesn't believe and gets killed on the road. I think it's, I'm more afraid of getting on your roads than I am with working with headhunters or, we have headhunters that have come to us. I mean, they're not headhunters now, but formerly they were. And they have become Christians and gone back to their own people and their teaching, starting churches and so forth. But I can't see that it's any more dangerous over there. Yes, my husband was killed in a car, but how many are killed here in a car? And you think nothing of it. Lois, the time has slipped through our fingers. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to look right into the camera, and I don't know to whom you will be speaking. A young man, a young woman, an old person, we have no way of knowing. But from your heart to their heart, talk to them about your Jesus. Friends, I want you to know that when I was a sheep herder alone, sometimes for a week at a time, I would see no other human being, but Christ was there. With my Bible, I would sit down and read what he was like. In the evening when the sun was going down and the sheep were quiet, I could talk to him and tell him what I wanted to do. I used to ask him, oh Lord, take me away from here, take me to your sheep, and different prayers like that. And I'd watch the sheep go, oh, the beauties of a red sunset, the quiet of it. But then there's stormy times when the coyotes come and you have to just fight to save your sheep because one is running this way, the coyote may kill one as it did for me. Only once I lost a sheep while I was hurting but the rattlesnakes can bite them, they will die. You suffer for that animal just like you suffer for a human because you love them, they are yours. And I tell you, if you follow Christ, you will never be sorry. It's not a dull, unexciting life. Do you think my life was dull and unexciting? I've had more excitement than most of you have in a whole lifetime. It's exciting when you see the first person that you are the only one who has taught them and you see someone take them down and bury them in the water and they raise a new creature. Oh, the joy, the peace that comes through your heart. And even when your husband is dead and you are looking at the church 
that you and he have been starting at the place where you have been preaching and you know the people are still coming and the people come to you and get on their knees even and beg and say, don't leave us, don't leave us. And I said, well, I hadn't even thought about it. And then they heave a sigh of relief. We were afraid when David was gone. But I didn't go there because of David. I went there because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is with me day and night. I know I can trust him anywhere, anytime. And if he is ready for me to go home, I can go home without a sorrow, without a tear. And friends, I want you to be able to do the same thing. If you don't know my Jesus to the extent that you are willing to give him your life and say, live or die, I am yours, then you don't know the joy that there is in living. Excitement is nothing. It's here a minute and it's gone, and then you're sorry for some of the things you did. But when you work for Christ and look back and someone comes running to you, oh, I remember you taught me when I was a little child, and now my mother and father are both baptized, then you know you won a child and the child has won someone else. Then you know joy and peace. Amen. Thank you. Bye. See you again. See you in heaven. Thank mm -hmm. you.